if you're going to create a promotion that generates a whole lot of leads on the front end, you better make sure that the steps are in place to take care of it on the back end. Uh, in terms of content, when you do lead generation, these are the five most reliable. Again, there's lots of other things you can do, uh, but I'm going to try and narrow your focus to the things that work uh, um, most effectively, most certainly, and here they are. Uh, one is uh, fear, huge alarm. Uh, the sky is falling right now. Um, and, um, and when you do this, when you use alarm slash fear in selling, um, yep, got it, thank you very much. Um, could be worse. I've had him deliver mail. <laughs> um, I told somebody the other day, I was the worst I've ever had. Um, I was in a ballroom and behind me was the kitchen. Uh, no, 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 this is not, no, it's not the kitchen noise. You can deal with that. Right in the middle, out through this door on your side, out through that door comes one guy chasing another guy with a knife. <laughs> Neither one of them speaking English, but both screaming very loud. And they go in front of me and fortunately out the other door. Um, what you wind up thinking about then from then on is are they coming back? You know? Um, anyway, when you do, when you use alarm, uh, or try and engender fear to create leads, here's the big rule. You can't do it milk toasted. You can't do it, ha if you're gonna scare them, they really gotta be scared. Um, it takes a lot to, uh, to create inertia and so, uh, to get them past inertia. And so you, you, you can't be halfway about that. If you're gonna use fear, you really gotta scare them. Second thing you can do is a huge promise. Key word there is huge. Uh, if you want to open the faucet as far as you can open it, when you do lead generation, the bigger the promise, the better. Um, and so, uh, you know, for the, uh, I mean, the, the axiom, you can never be too rich, too thin, um, you know, big numbers, big results, et cetera. Uh, curiosity. Um, it's used a lot in lead generation. It is, I think, one of the hardest to make work. Uh, you will see it used a lot. Uh, it's on the top list here because it is used so often. Personally, it's one I use the least. Uh, credibility, when you do lead generation, if you have the luxury of space, uh, it is very useful to have one or two or three lines that somehow uh, lend credibility to who you are or to the message. Um, and we'll talk later about all the different ways that you can create credibility and believability in advertising. Um, and maybe the most important factor that controls how successful lead generation is, is uh, how well uh, the message is matched to the market, uh, which is a recurring theme of mine. Um, the, uh, so here's some things to know. The bigger the market, the fuzzier the market. Uh, the harder it is to make advertising in general and lead generation in specific work because you're trying to talk to too many different people. So it's much harder to make this stuff work, say, in USA Today than it is in Fly Fisherman Monthly uh, because there's only certain people reading Fly Fisherman Monthly and we can tightly match the message to them. In USA Today, there's all sorts of people reading USA Today. Um, so when you pick your, when you pick your battles, um, it's a real asset in direct response to pick battles very carefully. Um, I, uh, as mo probably all of you know, um, uh, one of the things I do is speak on these big uh, success events. Um, the full day thing, and the people are in the sports arena, and we've got the presidents and the athletes and so forth, and Zig. And, uh, and uh, this year, I'm following Colin Powell a lot. Uh, two, years, uh, two years prior to this, probably half of the dates every year I followed uh, Schwarzkopf. And uh, these two guys are really interesting guys for a variety of reasons to a marketer. One is that they are the first uh, made-by-TV military 
uh, personalities ever in history. Um, they, are, they are the Tony Robbins of war. <laughs> in that, uh, well, they had their, you know, they had their own long running, multiple hours of day infomercial for months. And everybody watched them. Uh, we know they watched them because during Desert Storm, the regular infomercial industry took a horrible beating. Uh, worse than running up against the Super Bowl or the World Series or whatever was running up against the war. Man, everybody was watching the war. And uh, so it made these guys larger than life famous people. And uh, as a result, it made them rich. Um, uh, which is also probably the first of that that has happened, not from money from defense contractors, but like <laughs> arguably making an honest living um, after their military uh, careers. Um, I, I'm not sure if he's still at that level, but last year and the year before, for example, General Schwarzkopf's speaking fee was $75,000. Um, when you only do an hour, you can like squeeze in two, sometimes three a day. Um, you, you know, don't take a lot. Uh, and then all the NBC, you know, the NBC contract and the board of directors stuff and so forth. And uh, so one day we're, we're back in the green room and, and we're talking about all this. We're talking business. And um, um, I said to him, uh, he quoted a particular statistic about his income, which I won't repeat, but I said to him, knowing all of this, that uh, in a very short period of time after the end of your military career, you become wildly wealthy. Uh, the hardest way it is to accumulate wealth in America, no leverage, just from earnings. Um, knowing this and knowing how this has happened by being made by TV, uh, uh, not just political considerations now, but career considerations, what do you think is the single smartest thing you guys did? And he said, the easy answer, we picked a war we couldn't lose. <laughs> he said, if we had gone over there and got our butts kicked or been sending back body bags, I couldn't get 75 cents to give a speech. But we picked people, you know, who were surrendering to anybody with a box of Hostess Twinkies. <laughs> Got food, take the guns, you know? Um, it wasn't as good as Grenada, but, it, but you know, it was a flashier war. So they picked a battle they knew they couldn't lose. Now there's a great marketing principle there that affects a whole lot of what we do here today and tomorrow. And that is the receptivity of the recipient has more to do with the success or failure of the marketing pieces than do the pieces themselves. Now there's lots of different ways to say it. Halbert uh, explains this by doing the starving crowd story. You've probably all heard that. Um, a, a selection is, is where the battle is won or lost. You, you raised your hand real quick. Could you just repeat? Yeah, maybe. Yeah, that's why we tape it, because sometimes, yeah. The, the receptivity of the recipient has more to do with the success or failure of marketing than do the marketing pieces themselves. And that's why, by the way, you don't, in most applications that most of you would be dealing with, you don't have to get as good at this as is a top pro copywriter in order to get the results you need. If you deal with a highly receptive recipient, and so picking your battles becomes enormously important. Um, and when you do lead generation, see there's only two ways to get um, receptive re recipients, known to be receptive. One is, well, there's three ways actually. One is your house list, your own customers. But setting that aside, you can either go into the mailing list arena and essentially pay for the privilege of using someone else's receptive recipients, or you can do lead generation advertising to find them on your own. And that's what you're looking for. That's the purpose of lead generation advertising, is to ferret out these people who will be 
uh, highly receptive to what it is that you have to say. Uh, so picking battles that we can win, that's what lead generation uh, advertising is uh, all about. When we switch to direct mail and talk formats, um, here are the most reliable ones you have to work with. Um, first of all, let's talk self-mailers versus enveloped mail. Um, Everybody would prefer, if you wouldn't, you're not very bright, everybody would prefer to do self-mailers. If we had our druthers as marketers, we would do self-mailers. Why? Cheaper. Cheaper, faster, quicker. Don't gotta fold it, don't gotta put it in an envelope. We'd all do self-mailers. Uh, most of us don't because they don't work as well. Uh, however, uh, there's a couple things to keep in mind when you make this decision. Self-mailer versus do I put it in an envelope. One is pure economics. Um, and uh, a great uh, principle as an aside is no amount of marketing savvy, no amount of, uh, of product quality, no other factor can overcome bad economics. Uh, so if, if your numbers are bad, you can't fix it with marketing. You have, to, you, you have to live within the realm of reason. So the guy that owns a Baskin-Robbins store and is going to do direct mail to acquire customers for his Baskin-Robbins store is almost certainly limited to self-mailer formats because his transaction size and his total customer value number are both so small that he cannot afford to invest much in customer acquisition. Mailing to those same people, the chiropractor or the dentist, can almost certainly afford and should do enveloped mail for the exact same reason. His transaction value and his total customer value number are so high that he can afford to spend a lot of money on customer acquisition. So depending upon your business's economics, you may be forced into using these formats. Um, and if you are, then you just have to make them work as best as possible. The second thing to know about self-mailer formats is that often uh, they do work as part of a sequence. They shouldn't be your only piece. But when you are sequencing, if you open the sequence with enveloped mail, then at one or more points during the entire sequence, you can go to various kinds of self-mailers and be effective. Um, we have a sequence, for example, uh, in one business where I'm heavily involved, where there's three letters, four postcards, three letters, four postcards. The postcards work because they're set up by the letters. If you just mail the postcards to start with, which we've tested, uh, you can't run the business that way. Uh, your, your top self-mailer formats, the ones that small businesses use most often, of course, is, is the trifold, right? You get those all the time in your mail. Maybe some of you use them. Um, uh, and, uh, and, and unfortunately, they are thrown out a lot. Uh, it's probably the most common format, uh, the most commonly seen format by consumers. Um, and therefore, uh, you use it only when you have to. And when you do use it, um, you've got to really go to extremes on its outside to try and keep it from being tossed because people are virtually immune to that, which means, for the most part, we want to use other formats. We want to use big foldovers. We want to use odd-shaped foldovers. Uh, we want to print it sideways so it looks like it's different. Uh, we want to stay out of the most commonly seen format. 